Well, how he you, says you... he says we've actually made it. I'm waiting for people to appear in the right hand side. Oh, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But we've made it. We, we've made it. Somebody needs to check online. Oh no, there, there's it. somebody there. It's <laughs> great. <laughs> I don't they will expect us to come on at about ten past now. That's the thing. Yeah. This is oh, so Rachel, Rachel, back to you Rachel's then. first. <laughs> there she is. Rachel, Rachel and... is always first. She's like Rachel's like coming home and your dog's wagging the tail behind the door. She's always there. <laughs> And it's, it's, just, it's like a warm hug seeing Rachel and Matt come on. Um, Amazing. Oh, great, 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 great. Yeah. Right, so, guys, how's, how's, your, how's, your, how's the last fortnight been with you? Um, that hasn't happened the last fortnight. Um, uh, good, I suppose. What what has happened in my life? Uh, I, I can't really think of anything. Brent, do you want to go first? And I'll think of some life and make my life sound oh, more look, You know, uh, so much happens in life, isn't there? I think the first thing I would want to say is to dedicate this to somebody who's uh we've missed um she passed away last week uh she's an ex-president of the rfvs um <sighs> and you know uh lynn thompson um uh, bless her um has passed away and so i think if we can spend you know it puts everything into context okay mm -hmm. and i think if we can spend some time being positive online being positive with each other um which you guys you know viewing us always are to be fair i you know i'm amazed every week that you we see you peering coming in with your comments um but yeah it's um i think that's the one thing that struck me and it sort of overshadows everything else really sure it does. yeah so positive and we all knew her you know it's not yeah. just me it's, yeah you know, Lynn was yeah. actually the first editor of my of my book, Lynn and her mum, actually. Um, so when she had helped me out, she was the one that helped me out with uh, gastrointestinal kind of ideas because I looked at her as the kind of queen for that. She was over in New Zealand doing her thing, very uh, successful business person as well, very successful company, and she was the raw person in New Zealand and a uh, powerful intellect. So it should be before you two guys, I was talking to Lynn, or maybe Nick put me onto Lynn, but uh, she was so helpful. And... Um, yeah, just that that is a serious loss. So um yeah, very sad to hear that bit of news, all right. So right about trying to say say positive things because there's a whole lot of negative stuff coming down the radio waves at the moment, as there has been for the last two years, and we're like straight from one frying pan into another fire here with more. So it is very easy to get uh swamped with this negative stuff. So um that said, I'm gonna struggle to keep today's show very, very <laughs> positive because it is a touchy subject. Uh, Do I need to anyway. type in a rant alert thing? Have we yeah. got? No, I'm not. <laughs> not I'm, coming. I'm, just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be quiet and calm this week. But uh, yeah, no, you're right, Brad. She was. She was a lovely person. So you were very close to her yeah. as well, Nick, weren't you? She. She was great. She. Uh, she took over from me as the president for a short time, and she was. She was an absolute uh, a, a, a ball of energy. And um, she she got some good initiatives started, but I liked I, I like listening to her her lecture because she was so incisive, mm -hmm. and so she was thinking things that nobody else in the room was thinking, and she she was the first person that I heard to uh, talk about bone broth for healing healing the gut, for example, which is yes. maybe I'm a bit slow on the uptake, but it, she was talking about it really seriously and why it's so useful yeah. for healing the gut. So my God, we're going to miss her. Um, mm. so God bless her and her family. And tonight is dedicated to Lynn Thompson. Same, same as me, but without the P T H O M S O N no relation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so that was, that was her and, uh, we'll, we'll sorely miss her. So here's for you, Lynn. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't feel like I want to talk about my week now because I can't think of anything uh, very exciting that's happened. But uh, uh, yeah, so I don't really. We could oh, just get in straight can into Can I bring someone's... in a book? Can I bring in a book? Okay. Oh, it would be weird if you didn't, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been doing a bit of review, and you know, I think um, I really like to try and cross connect what we, humans are doing in functional medicine and what we're doing with animals. Uh, so just reviewing some of the text. Now, I'm not saying that this is the best book to read and follow and saying that it's ideal. There's lots of elements of errors within it. But Dave Asprey's um, Bulletproof Diet, which actually he's updated in his Audible version a little bit. So some of the things, I mean, some of his sense of humor is a little bit sort of 10 year old child. Um, and he did think it was funny because it was relating to his son and his son used to laugh at the jokes. But if you can put that to one side, there's some really good little elements in there that sort of follow some of the stuff that we're talking about, gut healing, redu reduction of inflammation, um, you know, so 
yeah, if you want to get on board with that, I would say, you know, take a look at that book and sort of review in light of some of the things that we've talked about over the last year. Um, uh, and maybe uh, we can do a little bit of a review of that. And Dave Asprey is, is prolific online. He's mm. he's always always posting stuff. It's nutrition stuff. It's all sorts of stuff. And he's he's a bit of a he's a bit of a, a live wire, I have to say. Uh, and he yeah. talks to everybody. Yeah. He knows everybody. He talks to everybody. Yeah. And he can he can he can communicate at that level with whoever he he, he talks to, whether they're a nutritionist or a physicist or a you know whoever it might be so he's he's and he yeah. always does it with and a I'm, bit of a kind of a wry smile yeah it? i'm just about to yeah. plow into headstrong which is actually supposed to be a review and a better version but i love to get into people's heads and process of how they got to a place rather than just get to the end text that is the updated one i love to sort of like understand that process um and and get there uh, a little bit like the paper you were talking about with um bladderstones and calcium oxalates and stuff yeah you know, no, interesting and, stuff and that one else. yeah so. um yeah yeah to get behind the, uh, behind the is bulletproof you know, is bulletproof the guy that got everyone putting butter in their coffee in the morning yeah yes. only it's not it's m yeah it's c8 uh mct oils really mm. Um, yeah. and it was about has that, has, that not come, has that not come around has that not come around again from all the the functional nutritionists are kind of saying if you're just talking about keto now you're probably a few years behind um is that is that what his new oh, yeah. book is about oh, no, he's updated it a bit you see okay. if you look into the depths of it a lot of people just felt it was keto and actually you became really gaunt and wasted and you didn't have any glycogen reserves and there was all of this problem but if you listen to it carefully he does talk about using for humans some intercalated carbs at the right time of day and actually building up your glycogen stores. So there is interest there that a lot of people, it's how people interpret it, isn't it? How they read a text and they, fi they fish out the bits that hits them in the brain and then they go off and do that and they're not necessarily looking at the whole picture. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's good for us and people like us on the human side to, to review that for people that are trying these diets and, and point out some of the weaknesses that are going on that they maybe have missed um, from those texts. And that's yeah. what I, I love. And then, you know, if we can draw that together for our pets and, and see how we can improve their lives in the same way, that'd be great. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think people um, people often take take an extreme view. It's a bit like, um, uh, who was the American who kicked off the whole ketogenic thing? What's his name? It's, uh, Atkins. Atkins, yeah. So everybody thought, oh, Atkins is just steak and eggs all day long. And to, to, you know, initially, the first month or so, it is very high in fat and high in protein. But actually, after that, he, he is a big one for bringing in vegetables and, and salads and, and what have you. But that salad doesn't make headlines. Whereas everybody eating, you know, eating uh, uh, steak and eggs and losing weight, that mm. makes that makes a lot of headlines. Yeah. So beware, yeah. journalists. Sometimes, you know, try and get the, the original information where possible. Go back to the original yeah. book, the original Atkins, the original Dave Asprey, and or see even what some of the original says. original studies that he's quoting from. Yes. You know, don't just, you know, the bits, he'll pick out bits from those studies that interested him. But actually, yeah. there's sometimes so much of a depth of information in those studies that you'll get from reading that. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, Exciting so, stuff. Uh, Exciting so let's let's let's, let's yeah. get into the show tonight. Uh, Nick, you wanted to start it off. So we're talking about antimicrobial resistance tonight. Uh, a lot of uh, stuff has been coming out. I mean you know the industry will call it the darker side I, I do believe that a lot of investment is being made to uh, induce fear and terror and antimicrobial resistance seems to be a big thing um coming up a lot there's a few studies that have popped out one in portugal um and the concern now is it's always concern with feeding fresh food is that there's a lot of uh, danger danger to feeding fresh food because we can't compare the two products for nutrition dare we dare to dream so it's all about fear so nick did you want to start off and tell us can you can you give us a broad scope what like can you start you love this stuff what can you start people from the start a little bit and then yeah i think you had a few slides i've got some slides yeah brian if you can get me really you, you big share screen you just I'll share screen, share screen, share yeah, screen yeah, and i'll hide home, our videos for now share. let's do that I'll, I'll be five minutes tops guys okay okay so <laughs> uh where do i put it 
over there. No. Nope. And Connor, they can still hear you, so please no swear. Yeah, so <laughs> don't make your usual comments, you cheeky monkey. <laughs> okay, so this is from a presentation which I did probably 2016. And so we were asking the question, what is resistance? And so Ellie, my very, very clever wife, get put together a load of graphics. Okay, these are original graphics. Unless you've seen this presentation, you will not have seen this before. And I always like to make things as simple, simple, simple as possible. Because if you can't read Peter and Jane, no way are you going to be able to read Tolstoy. You know what I mean? You, you have to be able to get your head around the simple stuff, right in you know, a primary school level, um, antimicrobial resistance before you can start thinking about, you know, transfer of genes between plasmids and, you know, all this really crazy stuff. So here we go. This is my ABC of uh, antibiotic resistance. And if you know this stuff, fine, great. Just take five minutes off, go and get a coffee. But if you don't, I hope this will really, really help you to um, come just so that we're all on the same page because it's really exciting stuff this it's very very in interesting so here we have fred and um dobbin and inside fred and inside dobbin there are a mixed population of bugs some of which we, the pink ones will say are antibiotic resistant okay that means that they've they've they if they see a certain antibiotic, it will not kill them, okay? And everybody has got these in their guts. And what, so what happens is if Fred or Dobbin take an antibiotic, what will happen? Sorry, that should... Because we'll happen. see his emails. <laughs> yes, you'll see my emails. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> so if, you, if Fred... That's what happens when you share your screen so fred and dobbin take an antibiotic okay they both take the same one and because they've got the same bugs inside and they both got the same infection okay and so what happens is all the little bugs the smaller ones the greenish bugs are killed by the antibiotic because that's what it's all about that's why it's called an antibiotic it means kills life kills bacteria but of course by definition the ones that are left are still left there within the gut uh, in this in this example but actually they're left everywhere in the body and so what happens is th those bugs that are left have less competition by the, all the other bugs that were there which have now been killed by the antibiotic so the antibiotic resistant bacteria flourish and so the, within days you've got more antibiotic resistant bacteria if if Dobbin or Fred then take the same antibiotic for a similar type of infection, they will not get better because all the bugs in there just, just laugh in the face of that antibiotic. And that is why antibiotic resistance, uh, how it grows and grows and grows. There's another slide just to put it in, in contact context. This is from the Telegraph. And if you look, so this is the history of antibiotics from 1928 when penicillin was first discovered right up until 2005 or so. And if you look, remarkably, this I think is a really, really amazing slide because if you look with penicillin, even by 1941, so this is before D-Day, they had found evidence that there were anti there were bacteria which were resistant to penicillin almost wow. before it hit the shelves and so what they did is in 1932 they invented another antibiotic because they thought oh blimey we might get resistance and that it by 1942 it had resistance and if you look every single class of antibiotic the tetracyclines the polymyxins you know to take take your pick the longest that they've been is about 30 years the polymyxins which are very very good at, 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 at resistance they only lasted about 30 years before but and, and some of them are have resistance within five years but what you can guarantee is that whenever you invent a new class of antibiotic which they haven't done for quite a while you are going to get resistance pretty quick and so you've got to be very very 
careful which is why i love using herbs for as in bacterial situations and i love using herbs in in uh, worm situations because you will not get resistance to these very very complex things called herbs because of all the all the many uh things in there so with the antimicrobial resistance just to put it in context they think that by 2050 that could be causing the loss of 10 million lives here 10 million lives a year by 2050 and the loss of a hundred trillion dollars a year that's 100 trillion with the t that's quite a lot of, lot of dosh the world health organization says it's the single greatest challenge of in infectious disease today okay this is pre-covid but i think that that would pretty much still stand there you go boys um and girls that's just a little a little graphical Flavor. resume so that we can all get our heads around this 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 thing of antimicrobial resistance it's about bacteria that don't get killed by popping antibiotics that's essentially what it is and i would like to just come in so some of the reasons that that resistance appeared so soon after the discovery of penicillins mm. is that we need to understand there has been millions of years of competition between fungi you know yeasts and, and single cellular fungi and, and all of that side of things and bacteria going on and what do they use they use effectively you know the fungi use antibiotics okay and the bacteria get resistant to it so they can reinvade that space and that has been a competition that has gone on for so long that's why natural antibiotic resistance is so readily seen um, and we need to understand this is not just because of our use of antibiotics it has been going on before and you know we need to understand that actually riverbeds will be full of bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics uh, and some of that is because of how we've misused antibiotics absolutely and you know through cattle etc and some of it is purely natural resistance that's out there so We've got to be really careful when we read some of the reports, exactly what's going on with that. Why is antibiotic resistance there? Are we causing antibiotic resistance with the type of bacteria that may be in food? You know, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Or are we actually dealing with you no know, antibiotics resistances around everywhere? And actually the new phase of trying to overcome that is by something we've talked about many, many times on here, you know, probiotics and actually pushing in more of the army of friendlies uh, to sort of starve out the, the horribles. Any yeah. thoughts, Connor, just before we dive in, any kind of just the big general point? I thought on a, on, a, on a broader scale, mm -hmm. I would have pointed the finger. I'm uh, as uh, the uh, mass production of meat, and I really thought <laughs> that the biggest problem was that. Now, it's probably because I'm obsessing about raw dog food, but even coming into raw dog food, I thought the way we're rearing animals, because people don't understand that salmonella and E. coli, the number one and two causes, you're, we're going to get food poisons, uh, although the number one and two causes in humans isn't actually meat, it's actually fresh fruit and veg. It's from uh, fresh fruit and veg that hasn't been washed properly, so it does contain a bit of fecal matter, and then we get it. So pe I think people kind of don't quite understand that salmonella E. coli is usually some sort of fecal contamination. So that's kind of interesting for me when we're talking about poisoning, because normally when you see it on lettuce and fruit, you don't associate it with uh, with poo, you know. So so with in our problem here at the moment in the meat sector is that we have these mass produced, uh, massive production facilities and they they kill chickens on a line. There's no humans involved, you know, they're they're zapped in a bath upside down, heads chopped, all similar sizes. They're eviscerated by a machine, which is a hoover up the butt. And, or a vacuum cleaner, I should say, and uh, up the butt and just suck it out. And the 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 gastrointestinal tract snaps at the throat and the anus, and they, they suck this goo out for your chicken nuggets and dry pet food. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so you're left with this you're left with this carcass. But what happens is that the inside of the gastrointestinal tract, you're invariably going to get some splashback as soon as that tube, that neat tube that keeps everything enclosed, the gut is enclosed. As soon as that breaks, you're going to get some splashback. 
And so the splashback doesn't happen in the chicken fillets and the wings and the drumsticks because they're away from the chicken carcass center. Where you're going to get that splashback is actually the chicken carcass, the inside of the animal where the thing breaks. And what is raw dog food made on? The necks and, and the carcass. But anyway, we know that uh, when we talk about salmonella E. coli, it, it is, am I right in thinking that it is all from... Uh, polluted like is it is it not initially from a farm animal thing or is it also uh fecal contamination from infected humans in our food chain or i was just blaming the intensive reared mega farms i'm just blaming mega farms for everything because outdoor reared animals don't have the same microbial uh the nasty microbials that uh, intensive reared they guys they do oh, yeah. they have the same, <clears throat> salmon, I had like 300 yeah. times less salmonella organic beef is that not right no no so the more intensively reared the animal the more likely the stress of that animal is going to reduce their uh, immune system and their ability to fight those infections or to have a normal gut flora that can outstrip those pathogenics so if it's but... going to be an increased you know nose to tail contamination but i think if you went out and you know not advocating people go and do this necessarily but if you went out and killed 100 squirrels um i'm sure you would come across some horrible bacteria at some point within small their amounts. yeah there is small amounts yes. in the general population but not like this huge amounts in every cow that's been slaughtered like that's a different level of risk like there's a study there 2021 even this is in the u.s or their organic meat is 56 percent uh, less likely to contain multi-drug resistant bacteria. But I actually saw some study where in, in the UK, outdoor reared meat was hundreds of times less likely to have the pathogenic salmonella because they're not like animals pooing on top of each other type thing. That's yeah. that was I just yeah the CAFOs, the CAFOs of the states, you know, that that's just obviously going to be horrible because you've just got yeah. nose to tail cows, you know, around food you know, that's in a trough, they'll turn around, you know, that's yeah, contaminated yeah, as soon as they, the cows turn. You know, you've got that recycling scenario going on. Whereas in more expansive farming, of course, there's less of that contaminant. Okay, so, yeah. But it's about how you can improve their general gut flora if they've got more expansive grazing, etc. Not necessarily that it's just that recycling and building of those um, horrible bacteria. Because the more you stress them, the more you have to use antibiotics to prevent them from getting the diseases of, of, of confinement, so the pneumonias and the diarrheas of this world, because as soon as you get any population, and human populations are the same, and you stick them in a concentration camp, the, the general level of bacteria rises, and so if you're trying to make those, those animals grow quickly, and not die, which is quite a favourable way yeah. to make animals grow, then you're, you're reliant on antibiotics. And also in the CAFOs, yeah, these are the big, the big feedlots in, in middle America, they, they, because they stress the gut so much with grain, they have to use antibiotics to stop overgrowth of bacteria within, and to stop acidosis which would kill these young calves, which are growing, growing, growing so fast. And so they have to use antibiotics to, to, to reduce acidosis. In the, in, in the UK, you're not allowed to use those antibiotics in that situation. And so what they do is they use bicarbonate to get keep the acid down. But they What's do the push acidosis, them. Nick? Where, do, where did that come from and why do from antibiotics help? From the grain. So, so the, the, it's effectively the fermenting them. of yeah, that, isn't it, yeah. by the bacteria? So, so, yeah, so, so cattle are meant to eat grass, surprise, surprise. You feed them grain, they do grow much faster because of the, the, the fatty acids that are produced and what have you. They do grow much faster, but they do get very acid. They get a lot of acid in their stomach, which more acid than they, they're supposed to. And one of the, the cheapest way to do it is you just dump loads of uh, antibacterial. You put the antibacterial in with the food, so and that keeps the acidosis down. And so they're, they're allowed, they're able to grow as fast as possible and not okay, die exactly. before they're cool but before they're cold okay and this is a really disgusting, so, disgusting this is how you can find disgusting. information everywhere so in the bulletproof he even goes through you know if you feed yourself grain okay so high starches it's about how it creates inflammation and increases <clears throat> insulin growth rate and deposits more fats within your muscle okay 
exactly the same thing happens to those cattle. If you take them off pasture and fatten them up with grain for the last 30 days of their lives before they're served up, it's actually a stress reaction of them depositing fat to marble the meat that is going on. It's not healthy meat necessarily. It's just fat marbling. That's not healthy fat in those circumstances. And that's, you know, isn't it ridiculous that we've thought that that's the best way to finish finish these yeah. cows? No, it's not yeah. the best way. It's the cheapest way. Right. It's yes, the cheapest yes. way. I've got some figures here in the nineteen fifty. This is witch. So this is this is a witch report, a two thousand and nineteen witch report. And in the UK in the nineteen fifties, what do you think the proportion of income that was spent on food, gentlemen? What do you think? How much of our of our of the income was spent on food? Forty. 30 percent oh, oh, yeah. okay 30 percent 30 percent guys um and then in 74 it was 24 percent and in 2016 it is 10 10.6 percent 10.5 percent okay so so that means food has got got one had, yeah what are the city it is a third as much a lot. yeah to feed a family today than it was in the 1950s okay i'm waiting for the comment to come up about but food prices today but anyway that's well, food, <laughs> See, food no, prices fuel food prices, prices fuel prices have gone up so people yeah, will probably changed. still be spending yeah. 10 percent. and 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 why what how can they produce food so so cheaply it's because they've got these intensive units yeah the, the, the more extensive the more grass that that animal sees the more expensive it is to produce because they grow more slowly. They are a lot happier. They're a lot healthier and they're good for the planet. But who cares about that? Let's just get, let's just make sure that we get, you know, some chicken nuggets and what have you. I want my, I want my 25 P burgers and then everyone complains when their Irish people are selling them horse meat. Um, So tell me, why is there so much, uh, um, like the likes of MRSA in hospitals, just keeping it broad, pro, keeping it broad before we get into it. Um, why is there so much anti uh, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria in hospitals located in hospitals? What's MRSA? Just define what MRSA is, first of all. Methicillin multi resistance, sorry, Staphylococcus aureus. Oh, yeah, yeah. Aureus. So yeah. it's basically <laughs> a bug, it's, it's really, 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 really common. What and uh, okay, I'll give you my, my take on that. It's because in in hospitals they use no in hospitals there are a lot of sick people and in hospitals there will be people who've had a lot of antibiotics because you know antibiotic 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 boom you're so bad you're in hospital and also um you've got lots of lots of sick people together sharing sharing their bugs yeah which and covid has okay. shown that you can share bugs very very okay. very easily yeah, yeah. So, okay so and if you greet everybody the... together, Mm. It's the antiseptic stuff. People don't realize that just some of those challenging chemicals that they're using as cleaning agents will also get you to a point where you are stripping out all of the friendly bacteria in the environment. And some of these resistant bugs can survive those chemicals. And that's why yeah. when you swab the environment, you can pick up those bugs. So Damn you, Colin, Glenn. I, I, you... I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to come in with that bit. That's oh, exactly sorry. <laughs> no, but great minds, great minds. No, like, so you've spoken guy, to us before about it, about probiotics. Just give us a little, a minute or two on, on the, pro, guy, on the use the of probiotics. From, I was talking to Joe, the guy who has the, uh, that uh, has Lusa probiotics. And uh, at least in the UK, Ireland, he's got the distributorship. It's a Luxembourg product, I think, or something like that. Right. Anyway, um, but he was the guy who first turned me on to the, this study, two big studies of two hospitals in Italy. And I'm going to I'm going to totally ruin the bastardize the data here. But in short, they compared uh, uh, like antibacterial spray downs of their hospitals and their cleaning floors and surface and stuff with antibacterial wash as most people do in their houses and compared it with a probiotic uh, cleaning down solution essentially whey wash but with a fancy name lactobacillus bifido in some water sprayed on the surface and the idea is as you said nick and as people are aware most of us here we've touched on answers pet food and the story behind that it's come up once or twice but these hospitals took the unbelievable leap to compare the two and they found that when you use probiotics it doesn't work absolutely instantly as antibacterial does, but antibacterial doesn't kill everybody because the ground, when you're at a size of a bacteria, is like a mounted range. You think it's a smooth piece of grass, but it's cavernous. And when you wipe the surface with a bit of antibacterial, you're killing 
a small amount of them and you're leaving some little hardy lads left who will grow back lickety split an hour maybe two and that surface has just been recolonized with bad bacteria that you didn't even know was there so it's ridiculous to think of cleaning down my kitchen with antibacterial an hour later you might as well have walked on it it doesn't well obviously not the same bacteria but look so these probi probiotics you spray them on the surface and they just get the nibbling and if you put enough of them down and repeat it you know morning and night as your cleaners come through the hospital after two days it takes 48 hours the resistance to bad bacteria, like of um, four of the six most nasty antibiotic resistant bacteria that plague hospitals, they've got a certain name because they live in hospitals and kill people. Uh, four out of the six were just down on the ground because of these probiotic sprays. And what's more, the probiotic sprays are perfectly safe. You could eat your dinner off the floor and not worry about it. Um, I thought a great ad for Luce's products, L-U-C-A-A. -A. Check them out. Makes a lot of different products for pets. Very good results in all sorts of issues. I do. I've got a lot of the faith in it. But I thought like a great ad is like when you spray down your babies, I've got kids at home, baby eating food. And when she's finished, you're looking at the manky table jammed and mashed into apricot smished. And it's like, how am I even going to get that off? And so you're cleaning it. And then inevitably there's an antibacterial spray. The temptation is when you're finished cleaning it down, clean it with antibacterial spray. So it's nice and clean. That's the temptation. And I thought a great ad would be, a probiotic spray would be the alternative after you've washed it down with a wet cloth that's reasonably clean i imagine if it's in your kitchen that you give it a probiotic spray and off you go and you leave it there and a great ad for those products would be a probiotic spray and you spray it on your feet on your finger and you put it in a baby's mouth you would never do that with antibacterial spray and you need to ask yourself why because antibacterial sprays are nasty we put these antibacterials in dry food and brag about their food is chemically inert isn't that great that is napalm in your dog's good floor, as are the treats they're fed and the rawhide chews and all the crap, crap, crap antibiotics. When you get a good issue from this crap food, what do you get? Antibiotics. So now you've got this probiotic approach uh, that I just thought was wonderful. And the more the guy talked to me, so I got his products in about a month or two ago. Shout out to him. Fair play, Joe. And I've got a probiotic spray from my or wash from my floor. You put a cap into warm water, clean the floor. I've got this two liter jugger of this green liquid that smells like mint and i put a tiny bit in my spray bottle and i wash it down after i've cleaned the surfaces i spray down a bit of probiotic now i'm not worried at all i was always looking at the baby crawling on the floor picking up stuff off the floor after we had washed it with dental well i didn't mean to say that with antibacterial <laughs> and i'm thinking how good how good is that that she's crawling around licking her fingers and eating food off the floor i was more worried about the antibacterial i put in the floor bit of phenolic now, compounds going down to poison the family uh, yes <laughs> yeah vocs and all the crap that's in that and now it's like i just washed my floor with the mop it's not dirty so why am i putting antibacterial in there it's a false economy you think you're cleaning your surface and studies show you know unless you're like surgically getting in there with a heavy brush and heavy you know Lit, um you know milton and that kind of stuff other than that that surface is is going to be recolonized in a heartbeat it's in the air the stuff is just landing back down on top of it in a, in a second so uh that was a real eye-opener talking to him and the hospital studies i will share them on patreon uh now but they are just they're gold dust yeah brilliant 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 yeah. brilliant okay where to now guys um uh there was a recent um study a recent study you were talking about connor have you um Got some insights into that. Um, yeah. With yet more the alarmist Schmitt studies. Um, yes, very, very alarmist indeed. Um, I, I popped it up. But from now on, I'm, I'm going to put my jog notes on Patreon before I come on. So people will see there on uh, Patreon, Raw Pet Medics on Patreon.com. Um, so I'm just going to consult that now. Um, so, uh, yeah, there was two studies have come out. So the industry at the moment is pushing, pushing, pushing the problem with raw dog food. And the problem we have is that, let's say in the US, which is way worse than here, in the US, they are permitted to have 6 to 10% salmonella, up to 16% campylobacter in their foods that are coming off the line, uh, let alone the stuff that sits on supermarket shelves. They're permitted this in the food chain. But raw dog food in the US has to have zero salmonella and E. coli, so that or as campylobacter, which is very difficult if the ingredients you're getting actually have the stuff on it and you don't add anything in there like chemicals to to get rid of it. So raw dog food is up against it. Dry pet food uses chemicals and ultra processing to, 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 to kill the bacteria. Raw dog food doesn't have that. So the raw dog food companies in the US are coming up with some novel ideas, answers to pet food. We've talked about them before. They use high pressure tolling to squish all the life out of it. But Europe and the UK were 
were scared silly after BSE and we cleaned up our meat chains as much as we could and we permit zero salmonella and E. coli in our products for humans and for raw dog food. So raw dog food is easier to make here in Europe because we get the ingredients that we assume is clean, studies show they're not, fully you know you can't get this out of the food chain if you're going to intensively rear chickens and cattle it's just not possible but we're told that the ingredients are perfectly safe and yet as a producer and i was on for two or three years you check the ingredients and it's like now and again they fail and you go back to this massive multi-million meat industry and you say uh, hi i'm the tiny little twerp that's out in wicklow making a tiny bit of dog food and they go yeah yeah i'll tell you what we just won't give you that food anymore see you later and you're cut off and your supply is gone there's not like this you're dealing with the lab assistant who sends it their antimicrobial readings believe me that's not, not what's happening in ireland it's sure as hell not hap what's happening in britain either but anyway, so we have that problem so raw dog food stews up the ingredients it gets grinds it all up freezes it and sends it back to you freezing doesn't kill any nasty bacteria that we're concerned about here salmon e. coli to any degree that worth a mention and we defrost the food and studies show when you test those foods in holland in the uk that some of them are failing for salmonella as is dry food when you test dry food we've done a number of studies of dry food there are studies of dry food containing antibiotic resistant bacteria susan Tixton picked 12 off the shelf and nine of them failed for hazardous bacteria off the shelf just in one little test so dry food has these issues and dry food has, has given 132 people salmonella over a decade in a decade where raw dog food poisoned exactly zero people in the studies so we know there's a problem with dry food as well but it's all talk about raw so this is where we are uh, until we start producing studies to counter it and go look how filthy dry food is look at the studies where humans are getting infected so the two latest studies in answer to your question brent sorry for that very long introduction uh is that uh yeah europe is, is your raw dog food is not going to be perfectly clean as well intentioned as everybody is it's just not possible and you're always going to have a few cowboys you know there's good great raw dog food products there's plenty of people selling really cheap beef at the back of a van and people are more than happy to buy it because they're four german shepherds and it's like i can't afford to feed them any other way so here's the two latest studies that the industry i'll say is beating the raw dog food industry with because fresh is dangerous of course it's dangerous to feed animals fresh food so the first one was a few years ago uk dogs uh, and they found that there was antibiotic resistant uh, E. coli in the feces of these uh, dogs. In fact, uh, raw fed dogs were five times more likely to have it. 25% of the stool samples that they selected. I'm not sure where those dogs came from. If you went to a greyhound industry, you will find dogs eating crap quality meat. So you're going to find more issues in the poo so when we have studies of contaminated dogs in fact the one or two studies we have of dogs getting salmonella osis both greyhound dog studies highly stressed fed crap quality food sorry greyhound industry but that's where you find the dirty the dirty stuff so i'm not quite sure where they got these dogs where 25 percent had uh, antibiotic resistance e coli because that sounds incredibly high compared to the other studies they have but who knows i'm not going to doubt them but they did find in five percent of the dry fed dogs they also had uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria so that was okay it's a bit of a warning raw fed dogs eating really poor quality raw dog food it's to be considered i in my opinion the second study has a major issue um and they are saying that they tested puppies within a 50 kilometer radius of human urinary tract infections and uh if how on earth did they do that i swear to god listen i'll read i'll read it out for a bottom you'll enjoy this comparisons <clears throat> between e coli isolates from puppies known to be located within a 50 by 50 kilometer region with those isolated from urinary uh, tract infections, human urinary tract uh, isolated in parallel in the same region. In that, which that, country? That. In which country? Because if you go... Uh, which one was that? Uh, I, I would have thought in any in a, any town of any size, uh, within a, a, any square mile, you're, there's going to be at least five <laughs> urinary tract infections. Yeah, that it's, was the UK. Uh, of course. And I mean, what, what are those people eating? What are they doing? Like, bloody hell. So we conclude here. Listen to this for a definite statement. We conclude that raw feeding is associated with carriage of ABR antibiotic resistant E. coli in dogs. Uh, it is uh, even at 16 weeks. And that bacteria carried by puppies are shared with humans. So they said that bacteria is shared with humans. And that is absolutely not what they found. What they found was they isolated in these puppies and then they isolated in these humans. And they said, maybe that's a link. The fact remains when people do proper studies investigating this, like Helsinki did with their 16,000 households. Have you ever encountered uh, in infection from your pet food? And so you're asking someone looking back over years, many dogs, thousands of meals each person, 
and they found two or three samples where they reckon they might have got it sick from the dog. And then most recently, Nikki Desicrantis, 6,000 households, zero linked to raw dog food. So it seems to be an incredibly safe thing to do. In fact, Helsinki suggested there might be an oral vaccination approach to having this food and living with this stuff uh, in and around the household, which I don't want to get into the reads about. But the point is, when we look at it, there's zero evidence of this. There's only evidence that dry food is causing this. And yet this is the same thing popping up. But it's not a reason to get complacent because there is God knows we need to do a show on bad quality raw dog food as well because yeah. there's more and more people selling bags of chicken, bags of beef, but it's not labeled. There's no company number. There's no recourse for you. And really poor quality meat with poor refrigeration and poor handling practices is nasty. And that if you feed dogs that nasty meat, they're more likely to poo out the nasty meat. So I believe in there is raw dog food's weakness because, you know, that's that's the that's the summary of where we are. Those two, two most yeah. recent studies didn't find an issue. It was a suggested that this may be an issue, but that's not the language they use. They use is associated, are, or we did find is a problem to humans. No, it's not. It may be. But there's no evidence of that yet, and when we look for it, it's not there. So, more. And I would. I always use the example of you know the practice before I was even there. You know they were advising on raw food feeding. So over 30 years, the practice in Northwest Leeds has been advising on raw food feeding. If if, if it was a definitive that raw food feeding was spreading nasty E. coli and salmonella infections to their parents, their their you know, families, um, then why hasn't Public Health England been all over the northwest of Leeds? Yeah. And if you're out there, yeah. I challenge you, I actually challenge you to come to the northwest of Leeds and show me the cases, okay, of yeah. where that's gone, because it's not out there. It's it's yeah. a proposed risk. We're back to this, you know, there's a proposed minimal risk, but because it's a risk that we can't say is never going to happen, we get beaten with it. And I think that's yeah. something to be uh, said. But you're absolutely right, Connor. I mean, look, um, you know, I thought there'd just be a couple of um, for raw food producers in uh, Scotland and Food Standards Agency Scotland, um, uh, having a chat to them, uh, they actually have said there's 50, 50, five zero producers of raw food just in Scotland under their remit. Um, what? No and way. A lot of those are companies that are effectively going out there and, and that meat that you said no i don't want it it's contaminated they go out there and they just say we can sell you this at x and those come those people just take it on Ooh. because that's where the dogs are getting the the uh resistant bacteria it's from meat which is infected with resistant bacteria and the poorer the quality of the meat and the more confined that meat was was grown in god bless it um the more likely that's going to get passed to your dog but also because you don't have a kill step because you're not putting it through a a, a factory to, to to kill the bacteria there is going to be a greater passage of these bacteria to dogs which really for me says that British agriculture needs to continue cleaning its act up so that there's less of these things in the meat, which can then trans there's going to be a reduction in transfer. So, yes, that raw meat does contain these bacteria, these resistant bacteria, but it's only there because it's present in British ag agriculture and because of the quality of meat that some companies are choosing to put uh, into our dogs so i think we have got a responsibility to to choose the best meat we can possibly afford and the most um, free range that we can possibly af afford but also we need to choose meat from sustainably or um, regeneratively farmed meat okay yeah. so i think that the, the, the pet owner of the future is not going to have five german shepherds they're just going to have one petite german Definitely. shepherd and 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 the cost of the meat will be higher but it will be much better quality and so that's that's i think how things are going to level out there's a lot of resistance all around the globe the resistance that, that is created by feeding dogs raw meat is is just a, it's a drop 
it's half a drop in an entire ocean. So I think they need to clean themselves up before they start coming after us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Therefore, I think there's politics involved. They're going, oh, look, there's resistant Definitely. bacteria. You know, there's this much this resistant bacteria. This is going to be a disaster when yeah. you've got all the CAFOs in America producing all this. Um, yeah. It's meat. like a... it's politics, guys. Remember that. Yeah. yeah, And I would say that another task that we can take on is what can we do to fortify our pets' guts, you know, their normal good bacteria? What can we do to establish that? Because that will further reduce those challenges. Because even if there are challenges, if you've got a wave of a million um, bacteria stood in the face of, you know, uh, 100 salmonella, are they going to have space to actually survive? Are they going to actually be able to overwhelm that? If you've got a really poor setup, of course, you know, there's there's a risk. But I think, you know, if we can fortify our pets' um, gut flora, and we've talked about this many times with the types of foods, the, the supplements that we can give, the probiotics that we can give, um, then it further reduces that risk from even the the harshest environmental meats like the the rotting carcass under the hedge uh, yeah. that they may come across you know the rotting fish on the beach that they've rolled in you know the the fox poo that they've decided to eat um you yeah. know all of those things that we know way are more worrying food. okay yeah, yeah way <laughs> but, but... more worrying <laughs> so no. those those are always challenges that are going yeah. to face our dogs and if we can help fortify them i think that helps look we've got a hats off to the british um farmers that have actually got i think it's now up to 60 percent reduction in their antibiotic usage yeah since yeah, they I brought in that. i mean that's a massive help and i think yeah. there's a lot of countries out there that are uh, also following that and and i think yeah. we should you know, say to those guys that are managing to reduce, that's really well done. But yeah. more work can always be done. Yeah, I want to touch the thing one thing more, more time what Nick was uh, alluding to there or, or, or said. Uh, like, raw dog food is the canary in the gold mine for an issue that most people don't realize you have until you work with the meat industry. The meat industry, when you work with it, teaches you uh, habits that you wouldn't admit to too readily because the meat industry has major issues and you only when you work on the inside of it do you know what they are. For example, if you're a raw dog food manufacturer, you get offered all sorts all the time. So people will pull up outside your door within a van with uh, 10 dead deer in the back of it and go, do you want some venison for your raw dog food? And unfortunately, some people say yes to that, but you need a vet to go through those and make sure that they don't have TB and whatever else. You know, there's, a, there's a proper procedure in place, but proper pr procedures are expensive. I don't want to spend the money. I want all the margin for myself. So you take the venison in, stew it up, sell it as qu top quality venison and make lots of money. It is very hard to say no to that. The fact is that raw dog food, if you find a study in Portugal, one raw dog food study in Portugal, where the raw dog foods, you know, they didn't come out too well and had some worrying things in it. And the, the, this was done, this, this study was just produced as a raw dog food. Look how bad you are. And it's like, do you think they're in there? Like, to, oh, I'll put in some antibiotic resistant bacteria E. coli and I'll mix in some Campylobacter. It's like, no, these guys are highlighting a mega issue that the, 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 that the, the, the people don't know anything about. You think your meat is perfectly clean because that's what you're told. But we don't have a very clean meat chain, unfortunately, because you guys are insisting on cheaper and cheaper meat. Listen to this for a stat. Um, somebody was just comparing about the different levels of bacteria in humans as well. Listen to this. Incidentally, pigs in the Netherlands are reared in such deplorable conditions that workers in the sheds are 760 times more likely to test positive for MRSA than the general public. <laughs> Unbelievable. 760 times more likely those people, they go home to their families and they spread it and everything else. So it's like we have a major problem with our meat chain. And uh, I'm not sure how that's going to clear up, but if this was a lesson to say, the biggest tip you could give for avoiding antibiotic resistant bacteria would be going with reputable companies because reputable companies, when they're offered cheap venison, uh, when they're offered chicken that's two years, it's got a shelf life in deep freeze of six months, I think. Some parts can get up to a year, year and a half. But when they're finished their shelf life at a year and a half, that company has to get rid of that. And it's supposed to be incinerated. Do you think that every meat, in, you know, reseller, it's a cut that that industry, the wholesaling meat sector. So the people that produce the meat are selling birds for like 30p, 40p, whole animals. 
But when the guys that get the meat and distribute it, they are working on tiny, fine margins. And if they have four or five tons of chicken wings that are now 18 months past their, or past their date, they don't just go to the local rendering plant and incinerate it. Bye-bye product. Not where I'll drive it out there and spend my money on diesel and staff member or call in the renderer. And in, what they do is they find someone to sell it to. Find the greyhound lad that'll buy half a ton of chicken wings off me. That find the raw dog food producer that'll take it and stew it up as chicken. And that's where the dodgier stuff can happen. And it happens all the time. And it particularly happens with companies that don't even stick their name on the bag. If you are buying that stuff, it's not that you're dancing with death. It's not like a dog's going to go four paws up. But you are increasing that's the, the danger stuff in the food. And that's maybe a talk for another day. The top co companies don't risk that because you have to have very serious in-out procedures and vets are coming in constantly keeping an eye on them because they're multi-million. It's the smaller companies who are trying to get off the ground. And, you know, the temptation is it's difficult for people. Most of them are fine, but, you know, um, there's money to be made, and that's unfortunately where So how about this, guys? How about next week, just as a thought, we do bad raw food and how to spot it? Oh, that's a, that's a gem. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, good, good and bad, right? pre, and good and bad pre made Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. And complete. Yeah. What, is, what is complete? Yeah, you know? yeah. So uh, I think that's, oh, a, that's pretty, a rabbit hole. It's pretty juicy. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty yeah. juicy one. So yeah, for next yeah. week we're gonna we'll do uh, a bad raw food and how to spot it. Okay. Yeah. yeah so I'm going to say like I'm going to say thank you, thank you, thank you to our Patreon supporters. They allow us to make this happen and to do research and and and, and get all these all these things happening. To say God bless you, Lynn Thompson. Uh, wish you were here to share you know we would have been interviewing you by now but you know yeah. mm. so but um yeah uh, thinking of her and her family um any final thoughts guys um no not really let's just leave it at that that's a good way to finish yeah yeah you know and and god bless you all for watching us today and putting up with our uh uh, little rants here and there. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, that was a bit ranty, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was holding back. So, I was holding back. So, yeah. yeah. So we look forward to seeing you next week. So it's how to spot poor raw food. And yeah. you know, we're quite happy to hang that out there and to help people. So, yeah. you know, um, let's, we're obliged let's to, to, guys. We're obliged yeah. to. Yeah, we are obliged think. to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Juicy. Great. See you later, guys. Thanks a lot.